Also, apparently he's the son of Ramses the Great, who had red hair. So Setna should be a redhead, in conclusion. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Welcome to Monster Donut, a literary and historical deep dive into the Percy Jackson series and all of its following spin-offs. I'm Emily, a classic scholar-ish. And I'm Phoebe, a dramaturg and story consultant. And if I've done my math correctly and have also edited this episode in time, the day that we're posting this is the day that Chalice of the Gods comes out. Um, so I'm probably having a mental breakdown somewhere. <laughs> but... For now, we are talking about the third of the Kane Chronicles Percy Jackson crossover short stories. The Crown of Ptolemy. Which I was sure I had read before. I'm still sure that I read it, at least at some point, because I remembered the uh, scene where Percy like looks at Sadie and thinks that she looks like she could be his and Annabeth's daughter. Like, I know that. I know I've read that part before, but the rest of it... I had no memory of and was shocked. I can't believe people don't talk about this one more. <laughs> I know. I was like, wait a minute. Hold on. We just went on a whole rant about like where we leave Percy at the end of Heroes of Olympus. And it turns out Rick was just saving the good stuff for the Kane Chronicles <laughs> short story crossover. I was losing it because I was like, in my head, I've had so many predictions for what's going to happen in Chalice of the Gods and like what I need addressed in Chalice of the Gods. Not knowing that it was already addressed in the third Kane Chronicles short story. I was sitting here waiting for the conversations about immortality and becoming a god and all of that. And I was like, this is going to happen in Chalice of the Gods. I still think it's going to happen in Chalice of the Gods. But you know what else was driving me kind of crazy, too, is like the tableau we like open on is like they're like surrounded by these fire breezing winged snakes, which literally is the fucking cover of the Chalice of the Gods. Oh, yeah. What's going on? He's just redoing it all. He was like, no one read the short story, so I'll just <laughs> do it again. <laughs> Maybe that's on my bingo card. Setna shows up. If you're not familiar with the short story, by the way, this is the third in the series. So both Percy and Annabeth have now independently met Carter and Sadie from the King Chronicles, who are magicians um, who deal with Egyptian mythology. And now this man, Setna, that Carter and Sadie have apparently encountered before is trying to become a god by wearing the crown of Ptolemy. Annabeth is sent a a message from her mother, Athena, to go to Governor's Island. They both have ways of contacting Carter and Sadie to bring them there when they realize what's going on. And Setna is able to successfully absorb the powers of one of the two gods, that form the crown so there's the he believe he absorbs the lower nile crown goddess and then he then summons the goddess of vultures and percy ends up getting possessed by the vulture goddess while they all work together to defeat setna and obviously they win it it happens all right my first note on this story is actually ah here's percy because i'd been like why aren't we getting percy's pov in these i I want him which i i liked that you know we talked a little bit about how in the last episode percy felt much more like the percy that we knew in that short story even though he was in an outside perspective it it was carter looking at percy and describing him but still here it like carries over and he still feels like like we're back it came back Mm. to rick so naturally to just like fall back into first person percy Uh, We also start with Annabeth revealing basically that they came here in the first place because um, Athena sent her a dream to tell her to be there. This is now the second time that Athena has appeared to Annabeth and sent her to seek out a foreign god, essentially. So the first time being in Mark of Athena when she's uh, sent off to find Arachne, but on the way encounters the Mithraeum and meets the followers of Mithras. And now she's got to go and confront this Egyptian dude. Mm Mm-hmm who uh, (laughs) summons the goddess of snakes and then goes to take a snappy with her. (laughs) I just realized I forgot to turn my fan off. (laughs) Sorry if the audio was terrible for the first (laughs) five minutes of that. Yeah, this this fight, I really enjoyed reading this fight because I, in my head, I always assumed that if Percy were fighting mid-rainstorm, because this, we didn't mention, it's like mid-hurricane. 
while they're having this fight. And Percy, you know, I always assumed that he would just be able to control the water and stop it. But he's like, actually, that makes no sense, Phoebe, because the water is constantly <laughs> falling on you and there's a lot of it. So he can't he can't Katara him is what you're saying. Right. <laughs> And so he's having a lot of trouble keeping himself, even himself, from, like, being getting wet. So the the fight goes very badly. Percy ends up losing Riptide because it's consumed yeah. by Setne. And when Carter and Sadie do show up, it's it's too late. And Setne has already summoned and consumed the god of Lower Egypt. There is a random detail in here where Percy, I think, says that before they ended up here, he and Annabeth were planning on going on a movie date. And I was like, this is the third time that this idea has come up, like you guys going to the movies. And I just love that that's like a regular thing that they do, apparently. Yeah, like normal people. Yeah, like last time it was that Percy was at the movies with their friends, question mark, whoever their friends are. (laughs) And Annabeth wanted to be with them, but had to go to her job interview. And then there was the one in Battle of the Labyrinth. So even before they were dating. Yeah, when they were going to go see Surf's Up. Oh, wait, do we need to figure out... What movie they were going to see? I don't know if we know what year this is. If we were going by the same logic, it's like 2009. Is it finally time for... uh, (laughs) When did you last see your father? (laughs) It might be. (laughs) It might be out of theaters, though, because it's August probably at this point. Yeah, I googled it. It's happening. They could have gone to see Julie and Julia, which I just watched the other night. A lovely, heartwarming tale. They could have gone to see The Time Traveler's Wife. Inglorious Bastards. Ponyo? My guess is, like, they were going to go see The Time Traveler's Wife, and then they were like, the, I don't know if I want to handle this story about um, a guy that keeps vanishing from this woman's life. <laughs> it could be a movie from July 2009, which would include The Half-Blood Prince, Oh, 500 Days of Summer, and G-Force, the classic guinea pig hit G-Force. <laughs> That would also summon the PTSD. Like, yeah. I don't think they're going to see G-Force. <laughs> Annabeth suggested it as a joke, and Percy was like, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, anyway, so <laughs> now that Carter and Sadie are here, they decide to make their way after Setne slowly. Percy and Sadie want to, like, charge after him, but Carter and Annabeth want to stop and make a plan, so they settle on in between where they can plan while they walk. And I do want to point out the quote that was the only quote from this story that I remembered, which is when Percy is watching Sadie jumping in the puddles. He says, She leapt from puddle to puddle in her combat boots. She hummed to herself, twirled like a little kid, and occasionally pulled random things out of her backpack. Wax animal figurines, some string, a piece of chalk, a bright yellow bag of candy... She reminded me of someone. Then it occurred to me, she looked like a younger version of Annabeth, but her fidgeting and hyperness reminded me of, well, me. If Annabeth and I ever had a daughter, she might be a lot like Sadie. And like, it's a great little, you know, Persebeth moment. And is also what I used for a very long time to (laughs) make people acknowledge the fact that either Percy or Annabeth had to be a person of color for their daughter to look like Sadie. (laughs) You're not wrong. You're not wrong. (laughs) But what I'm more focused on right now is the fact that Percy looks at her and sees himself and like what of her he sees himself in. Mm. Because he also, the quote goes on to say, I'd have a little girl who looked like Annabeth and acted like me, a cute little Helion of a demigod stomping through puddles and flattening monsters with magical, (laughs) with magic camels. And I just, I like that his image of himself in his head is just, like, a cute little monster that's, like, a little bit all over the place, a little bit chaotic. You know, the bright yellow bag of candy, replace it with a bright blue bag of candy, and it's just, it's mm-hmm. it's very, like, innocent yeah. and, like, sweet, the version of himself that he sees in her. Yeah. But again, he's, like, you know, almost graduating high school at this point, so... I think he's also seeing his younger self in her, too. Mm -hmm. Which is funny, because his younger self wasn't... His, like, older self is more like this than his younger self was. Like, his 12-year-old self was a little bit more intense than this. Well, made me think of, like, 9- or 10-year-old Percy was a bit more of a Hellion, because I would guess that, like, the more schools he's getting kicked out of, the more things that, like, aren't his fault that are happening, like, the more he's, like, trying to be a good kid. 
so that's where I'm getting like the younger self from. It's like the per- the version of him that hasn't had to become more serious. It hasn't like gotten angry. Yeah. I feel like we did kind of skip over and I do want to come back to like the Riptide situation though. Because I felt like a huge pivotal moment in Annabeth's arc is when she loses her knife. So here we're seeing Percy like the kind of the scales getting equaled. Like this thing that has been a part of his identity for so long since like book one of this series. Since like chapter one of book one. We're seeing that just like instantly become consumed. Yeah, it's interesting because then later on when we get to this moment where they're walking Annabeth remembers how when Sadie gave her her wand that it just turned into her old knife and so Carter realizes that he can give Percy his wand and it should presumably do the same thing but when he gives him his wand it doesn't it turns into a copus which I wanted to talk about because I was curious why the wand did that (laughs) because what it's I, I googled it just to like Mm. you know, look at it with my eyes. And Wikipedia describes it as a heavy knife with a forward curving blade, primarily used as a tool for cutting meat for ritual slaughter and animal sacrifice, or used to refer to a single edge cutting or cut and thrust sword with a similarly shaped blade. So the sword in this is most likely the second one, but I think it's fun to think of it also as the first one. (laughs) Just as like a a why the wand looked at Percy and was like, you need something that's made for uh, slaughter (laughs) 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 and like animal sacrifice and rituals and like stuff like that. Mm. And why it wouldn't just give him riptide. Yeah, although I think it it also is like, it's a cool like, this is maybe the Greek version of an Egyptian thing, which I enjoy. Yeah, I, I mean, I understood it as that and like what it says in the book. I was more curious just like, how the wand, which was able to connect so deeply with Annabeth, gave such a, like... Mm. I, I was trying to find the the depth in this sword being given to Percy and why it would, like, connect with Percy on, like, a soul level because it, like, hurts to grab the wand because it's, like, soul bonding with you. And then it gave him this, which doesn't... Mm. It, it's, it's not random because it, they explain it as like, oh, well, here are the like logical reasons why it's there. But it's like, okay, but what are the like emotional reasons that it's there? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, one of the primary reasons why Rick was drawn to this particular weapon is because it's noted by ancient historiographers that it's a particularly good sword for cavalry. So if you think about it, a lot of traditional Greek short swords or the Roman gladius, they're double-edged. So they're more made for like stabbing versus a copus. It's a one-sided blade that's like heavy on the end. So it's really, really well suited to like big strikes downward, essentially, which is why it's so good for cavalry. So I think there's a lot. There's a few different interpretations you can take on this one. My favorite is that uh, Hazel and Percy have been hanging out a lot. <laughs> um, he's also, you know, child of Poseidon, so of course he gets like the horse weapon. Mm, right, the wand sensed that he was a horse girl. Yeah. (laughs) But I think what makes it so suited to slaughter is what I mentioned is sort of like very end heavy and one one sided. So you can't really like defend with it or parry. It's more just like a single like range of devastating cuts you can deliver. Mm. And I was reading somewhere that it's like kind of if you cross a sword with an ax because of the level of like torque you're able to get on an axe you're able to deliver like pretty devastating blows with it like much harder than you would be with singing a sword and this sword kind of provides that same amount of torque and leverage so it's definitely like a brutal weapon intended to inflict brutal blows Mm. so they go back and forth trading like magic spells and annabeth gives carter her invisibility cap hoping that it'll work when it's on him instead of on her. Just trying to, like, combine Greek and Egyptian magic. Yeah, because something that's kind of become a trend that we've seen developing in these short stories is that this Greek and Egyptian combination is much more powerful than either the Greek or the Egyptian alone. Although, interestingly, Setna, when he's talking about it, mentions that after Ptolemy, again, a Greek, Macedonian Greek general, of Alexander the Great um, ended up taking control of Egypt and started combining Egyptian and Greek magic. He says that that made the Egyptian magic diluted and weak, which is why he was unsuccessful in his attempt to make himself a god. 
got me crazy. I don't know if it makes sense to me that Ptolemy would try to make himself a god. He seems to have been, like, the least... Rel- I mean, the guy again, this is, like, relative, though. So he seems to have been, at the very least, the most shrewd and possibly also the least power-hungry of all of Alexander the Great's generals. Most of Alexander the Great's generals actually tried to be his successor, just get it all, take the whole thing. And Ptolemy was, from what we can tell, the only one that played it a lot smarter. Where he didn't, he just took arguably the most lucrative territory, which was Egypt. And he did attempt to expand into the Middle East later, once he'd established his power base. So, I don't know. I would classify him as more of a clever trickster type than necessarily a I'm a god type, if that makes sense. Mm. So we track down Setne, who is trying to summon Nekbet, who is a vulture goddess. The goddess of Upper Egypt. Yeah, the goddess of... Or Lower Egypt? She's the goddess of Upper Egypt. And if Setne manages to uh, absorb her too, then he'll have both parts of the crown and will be a god. And um, he manages to take the crown, but they're able to successfully stop him with a combo of uh, all of the explosion tricks and the Greek and Egyptian magic. And they're able to send him on the run and have her around. Yeah, they managed to keep uh, keep her from being consumed. If you haven't read the Cain Chronicles, there's this thing that the gods can do with mortals where they basically become a person's patron god. And because of that, are able to possess that person. And it grants the god some power in the human world and makes the human more powerful too. And it's not meant to be like a total possession. It's more like a symbiotic relationship. So like uh, Sadie and Carter both have like patron gods. And so here, Nekbet suggests that she possess Percy and that together they can defeat Setne. Yeah. And what's interesting is Percy is really resistant to it. And also Annabeth is like, no, 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 take me. Yeah. And like, I mean, I feel like your mind can't not go straight to like the Kronos situation. I know. <laughs> when you hear this. And like, I, I don't think it's explicitly mentioned at all in this short story. But that can't not be one of the first things that Percy or Annabeth are thinking about when they think possession by a god. But when Annabeth jumps in and tries to say, like, take me instead, Nekbet says, uh, your mind is too wily, girl, too stubborn and intelligent. I couldn't steer you as easily. <laughs> and Percy's like, thanks. <laughs> My host needs a certain level of simplicity. Percy Jackson is perfect. He is powerful, yet his mind is not overly crowded with plans and ideas. <laughs> Which I first, at first when I heard that, I was like, Annabeth is too stubborn, but you'll use Percy? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't totally make sense to me but. I think it does though because when you actually get the them together she brings out an interesting side of Percy yeah no it, it made sense once like I, I feel like this short story is is really pushing the you know Percy is impulsive and doesn't think through his actions before he goes for them angle and that this is like a reason that Percy is perfect to possess because his mind isn't crowded with plans and ideas in the way that Annabeth's is. Which, when I first read that, I was like, I want to argue. But then I was like, okay, I won't. <laughs> because it's it's not like he's planning. He's planning ahead, but, like, in the moment. He's not, like, actually coming up with plans most of the time. So I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah. And he also, there's an interesting moment, too, where he is comparing Nekbat to the recent battles with the giants, and specifically the other gods and how they behave. And I feel like the reason he's willing to go with it as well is that he notices that she is very different from the Greek gods and that she's actually willing to be an active participant in this battle. Yeah. She's not just sitting back like, oh, go do things for me. She's like, all right, let's do this. Work together. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a very important aspect of why he's willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But to do it, she needs his consent, which he at first, like, can't get himself to say yes and looks at Annabeth and she's like, I don't know. (laughs) This is up to you. I don't know what to do with this situation. And finally, he decides that because his friends need him that he's going to say yes. He says yes to Michael. He says yes to Michael. Just like Jake Abel. Wow, it's all coming full circle. (laughs) We might need to explain that joke. (laughs) Just watch Supernatural and you'll get it. (laughs) So Percy says yes. And he describes this moment 
As thousands of years of memories flooded my mind, I saw pyramids rising from the desert, the sun glittering on the Nile River. I heard priests chanting in the cool shadows of a temple and smelled myrrh incense on the air. I soared over the cities of ancient Egypt, circling the palace of the pharaoh. I was the vulture goddess Nekbet, protector of the king, shield of the strong, scourge of the weak and dying. Ed Percy has to focus on where he is currently so that he can, like, keep a hold of himself in this moment and Nekba is in his head trying to get him to let her take control mm. and it's like a page long him trying going back and forth with himself trying to retake control of his body because Carter says that he has to try and find a balance between letting her take over and not fighting her but Percy struggles with it at first and ends up like insulting Sadie and then having to like run it back and be like I'm sorry that's Nekbet talking it's not me and <laughs> and Sadie's like yeah I know she's like I get it <laughs> but like he really he doesn't have a handle on this even when they're going into battle after this yeah and it's it's only in the moments I think where he observes that they have a mutual goal that it like actually works but as they're heading into battle is when we get the confirmation of something that Annabeth thought about in the last short story, which is Percy, while he has this god in his head, is able to see the mist is actually part of the duet. It's like the top level, he says. It's like the first level where the mortal and immortal worlds meet. And then the duet just keeps going after that. But what I found mm -hmm. interesting about that was that it's not actually disorienting to Percy in the way that it was for Annabeth, because this mm -hmm. is the way that Percy sees when he's underwater, basically. Which I always forget that Percy sees, he doesn't actually see underwater. He sees in like thermal colors while he's <laughs> underwater. Mm. I, I, I didn't realize that until just now, so. Yeah, I forget it every time. <laughs> but he's, he says that it's easy for him to get used to because this is just how he sees when he's in the water. That's interesting. I wasn't, I was actually thinking about something else when I was reading this scene. There's this thing that's like the aether, like the upper air that's in both like Greek and Roman mythology, where it's like this, again, this boundary between like the mortal realm and the land of the gods. So I was picturing like almost like that for the mist of like this boundary line. Because hmm. like, if we're talking like ancient, ancient Greece, they kind of believed in the earth, which is like a flat place with a dome on the top. And so the eye there was sort of the place where the dome meets the heavens. That being said, there are plenty of ancient Greeks that like thought the earth was round. Like we, we figured out, I think Eratos Senos was a Greek mathematician who figured out the circumference of the earth. So I was thinking that this like concept of that, like the eye there was sort of like the mist and the duat. But I enjoyed it being like instead of the mist, which is as we pictured it before, at least as I pictured before, was sort of like something that's like can be summoned to obscure things. I liked that it here it's described not as that, but as the barrier. Yeah, it makes me wonder this whole short story really makes me wonder how comparable all of this is to what Luke was experiencing being possessed by Kronos. Ooh. and like did he see differently or like the whole process of it i was like is this the same thing or is it different because it's egyptian gods mm -hmm. and so i i was wondering if like this was something that luke got to see too or if it's like because they were greek gods that they see it differently or a greek titan that they see it differently mm -hmm. i'm on a mission to bring up luke whenever i <laughs> in every single episode <laughs> so this is this is that one <laughs> I mean, I, I'm thinking about that now. That's a good point. That's a very good point. I'm also thinking about Hazel right now because I'm thinking about how this changes our idea of the mist. Yeah. Here's how I'm thinking about it now. Maybe instead of the mist being this thing that comes in and obscures things that you can create things out of, I'm thinking about it more like the labyrinth where it's just like this series of like rooms and doors and chambers that's extremely difficult to navigate, extremely unpredictable that shifts and moves around all the time and like constantly like changes its entire architecture in a way that is not physically possible in the mortal world. And it's not so much about Hazel creating things out of the mist as it is her finding where that already is in the immortal world mm. and pulling back the curtain. And I think that's also potentially why it's easier to summon things that, like, people want to see or want to believe, because those are things that are potentially, like, closer to existing. Very everything, everywhere, all at once of you. <laughs> I haven't seen that movie yet. I'm sorry. Oh, you should go see that. 
I know I should see it. I know. I know. I know. So Percy uh, enters the battle along with his new friend and uh, his other friends. And the plan is basically like Percy charges in there while Carter's got the invisibility cap on so that he can sneak up and like Sadie and Annabeth go and do some magic somewhere else. But the plan goes sideways when Setne starts trying to get into Carter's head Mm -hmm. by telling him that if Carter joins him, he'll be able to do anything, including bring his father back to life. And this triggers something in Carter. He he takes the invisibility cap off and throws everything off. (laughs) Then once Sadie appears, Setna makes the same offer to her that, you know, you could become a god with me. We could tear up the universe and destroy things (laughs) is what he offers her. And and she's very tempted by that. Yeah, she's like, wow, you you really know me. (laughs) Which is interesting considering, you know, she's compared a lot to Percy in terms of her personality. (laughs) So... As the fight goes on, they're doing worse and worse until Carter is, like, extremely hurt at one point. Like, possibly dead. And Percy basically grabs a hold of Setne and flies into the sky using his new vulture powers. And as Setne is struggling, Percy feels, he gets this, like, cold feeling that he describes as chilling his wet clothes and soaking into his bones. And he assumes that it's a subtler attack that's probing for weakness. But then Setne says, Don't you see what an incredible opportunity this is? A perfect do-over. You of all people should appreciate that. The Olympians once offered you their most valuable gift. They offered to make you a god, didn't they? And you, you lovable idiot, you turned them down. This is your chance to correct that mistake. And Nekbet scans Percy's memories and sees him turning it down in the throne room. And it says, Zeus offered me a reward, godhood. I turned him down flat. I wanted justice for other demigods instead. I wanted the gods to stop being jerks and to pay attention to their kids. A stupid request. A naive thing to wish for. I gave up power. You never give up power. And then he, ch- he tries to shake that thought off and says, Nekbet, those are your thoughts, not mine. I made the right choice. And she says, then you are a fool. I feel like I'm going to just quote this whole scene, <laughs> but it's all important. It was really good, yeah. Uh, Setne says, I got to agree with Nekbet on this one. You did the noble thing. How did that work out? Did the gods honor their promises? Percy says, I couldn't separate Nekbet's bitterness from my own feelings. Sure, I grumbled about the gods all the time, but I'd never regretted my decision to stay mortal. I had a girlfriend. I had a family. I had my whole life ahead of me, assuming I could stay alive. Now, maybe it was just Nekbet in my mind or Setne toying with me, but I started to wonder if I'd made a huge blunder. I get it, kid. Setne's voice was full of pity. The gods are your family. You want to think they're good. You want to make them proud. Setne tries to relate to Percy by talking about how he also had a powerful dad and that he felt like he needed to prove that, you know, if he made the right choices and prove that he was a good kid, that he would eventually notice him. And then he started to realize that doing that only made it easier for the gods to ignore you. The only way to get their respect is to act up, be bad, and take what you want. And Setne finally says, you're a good kid, a lot nicer than the goddess you're trying to host, but you've got to see the truth. You should have taken Zeus's offer. You would be a god now. You'd be strong enough to make those changes you asked for. I'm giving you a second chance. Help me out, Percy. Become a god. I just love this moment. Is it everything you wanted? This is literally the struggle that I wanted to see in Chalice of the Gods. And when it started happening in front of me, I was like, it already happened and I didn't know. (laughs) Because I, I've been saying that, like, now, post Heroes of Olympus, is the time to return to that decision that Percy made, and, like, for him to question whether it was a good one, and whether it would be better to, it would have been better to have taken immortality to, like, try and make the change himself. Mm. This is the kind of thing that I need Percy to be confronted with again, because he made the gods make that promise, and then they never kept it. And he realized that throughout Heroes of Olympus. And then what is he supposed to do with it? And like Mm. being offered that choice again was always something that I was like, that would be an easy way to bring this back up again. And so I assumed Mm. Chalice of the Gods is the place to do it because Chalice of the Gods, if you haven't read the summary, the chalice gives you immortality. It grants you immortality if you drink Mm. from it. And so I was like, it's got to happen there. No, apparently it's got to happen here. And I just love how much time is dedicated to it. I was worried when I was reading this scene that 
Percy would immediately be sort of like, I don't want that, or that like all of the thoughts that were thinking of it positively were all going to be brushed off as like, no, that's Nekbet thinking that. But I'm mm-hmm. glad that Percy is given the opportunity to actually like rethink that decision and actually consider whether or not that was the right decision. Like really just sit in that feeling of like, none of this went the way that it was supposed to go. And like, what am I supposed mm. to do about it now? And the fact, like, it's one thing for it to be tied back to Zeus just as, like, king of the gods, but the fact that it's tied back to family and, like, your family Mm. failed you. He did a good job of getting in his head here. (laughs) If Cronus really wanted to get in Percy's head, he should have been saying things like this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Something I thought that was interesting also is the fact that we have to have Nekbet in his head for this to be happening. Because the thing with, like, her thoughts, uh, the way it's framed in the story, we you're never, like, 100% sure whose thoughts it is. Except for, like, the handful of times he starts thinking about eating carry-on. <laughs> There's a lot of moments, like, even when he first gets possessed where he'll say something and you're like, oh my god, yeah. why did he say that? And then he's like, I'm so sorry. Or, like, he'll be mid-sentence and then she kind of takes over for a second. Um, and even here in this scene, it's not fully convincing to me when she says you you never give up power and Percy is like Nekbet those are your thoughts not mine I made the right choice like that power is something that appeals to him and not mm-hmm. necessarily power in the way that you know Nekbet is thinking of it but the power to do something and to have that control is something that appeals to Percy it was also really interesting when when Setna first brings up how Percy turned down immortality the quote is that Nekbet is both incredulous and offended also, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Like, the mere concept of turning down immortality to her is not just, like, crazy, but offensive. And she's always in there, like, why are you giving up power? Why are you willing, why are you willingly becoming more weak? And that's sort of what's driving her as well into being more on Setna's side, despite the fact that it's not in her best interest to be doing so, you know, but she's sort of at the mercy of other people who she perceives as strong in that way. Like, she's sort of trapped by her nature. Mm -hmm. In a way, though, it kind of lets him off the hook, because I feel like it gives a voice to all of these thoughts that are in him, but it also lets him dismiss them as not his thoughts. Yeah, which is why I'm hoping that this is just, like, the seed of something that we'll start to come back to in the next book. But then there's also this interesting theme, though, of you're able to, like, take from other people by, like, relating to them, because at the end... Percy realizes that Setna is trying to relate to him in order to, like, get in, basically, in order to start taking. Yeah. And he notices that it's the same thing he observed him doing with um, the Duat, where he was feeding on these, like, divides between worlds and, like, creating fractures and sort of, like, taking what he wanted and leaving the rest. Which I found really interesting that, well, both that concept and that that was what helped Percy through this. It wasn't like him realizing Setna was wrong or that he did the right thing. Because I don't think he's like fully understood that until the end of the story. Mm-hmm. I think at this point, it's it's he's still sort of lost in that thought. And it's only by realizing what Setna is doing to him that he is able to try to keep Setna from connecting with him. Mm. And like, even if Setna is right their motives for being like immortal even if he said yes to this like the the motives and means that Setna is using are totally different from anything that Percy would want and so what Percy says to him is you're looking for something that you can relate to and use against me but I'm not like you I don't want immortality especially not if it rips the world apart which when he has that realization by this point he has like fully lost control of Nekbet and ends up you know, plummeting out of the sky. And so Percy falls into the water and he kind of wakes up and it says, whatever the case, I felt great. I grabbed Setne by the throat with one hand and began to squeeze. (laughs) Just immediately is like, I am killing this guy. (laughs) A Percy classic. He says that, you know, Setne is clawing at his arms and it seems like he's maybe trying to cast spells or trying to sweet talk him out of strangling him. And he says, I, I couldn't hear him and I didn't want to. Underwater, I was in charge. Nekbet says he can't be defeated here. You need to bring him back. Because we haven't explained that, the, that they do have a plan. <laughs> mm. They do have a plan to, like, 
capture him that Sadie and Annabeth have been working on this whole time. Yeah, they're trying to track, uh, trap him using a spell from the Book of Thoth that he has been using to become mortal. Yeah. So Percy drags Setnay back to shore by the throat, takes him over to this, like, I don't know, this chalk circle that they've made that uh, is the trap. Um, Setnay makes one last plea. He says... You can still be a god, all of you together we can, and Percy interrupts him and says, I don't want to be a god. You don't get that, do you? You couldn't find anything about me you could relate to, which I take as a big compliment. And then inside his head, Nekbet says, kill him, destroy him utterly. And Percy thinks, no, because that's not me either. This following the, you know, the violence that he did underwater (laughs) of like trying to choke Mm. him and kill him and then him coming out of it and saying like killing him and destroying him wouldn't wouldn't be me either. This moment was interesting to me because the violence is something that is him. It's very much him. We've learned that. Mm. And like he also stabbed him straight through the stomach and asked him to die earlier in the story. (laughs) (laughs) But this is Percy, you know, knowing that there is another way saying see that's not who i am (laughs) to quote dean winchester in season 15 episode 19 (laughs) of supernatural (laughs) oh my god no this part to me reads as more like him choosing that that's not him as opposed to it actually not being in his nature like i don't i don't want to be able to relate to you like he's saying like we don't re- I don't relate to you at mm. all as if he didn't have like an entire moment like a, a two yeah. page long moment with him like he clearly did find something that he could relate to but mm. this is Percy saying like I don't want to be that person which I feel like I'm actually getting a li- like a hint of the closure that I need post Tartarus with this Mm. with him actually like having one of those moments of violence and then coming out of it and being like I am not that's not who I'm going to be Mm. something else that's interesting this might be a complete topic change I think the conclusion to the idea of like why is it that when Ptolemy came to Egypt that like was weakening the magic versus like now it's strengthened with Percy and Annabeth and Carter and Sadie working together. Because I do feel like, in a way, this is also a story that benefits from having a lot more perspective on the West and, like, a lot more perspective on, like, as Percy says, the difference between, like, sharing and stealing. We're getting that do-over, in a sense, of, like, him getting off our immortality once again. But instead of the first time where it's given like as a gift to Percy that he's expected to be grateful for. In this version, it's like he's supposed to be sort of stealing it, essentially. And I think it's interesting also that because he's not really being presented with the same choice that he was given in the first series. Because in the first series, it was kind of made clear that it was a gift, but it was a gift with strings attached. It was a gift that would not free him so much as it would bind him. And then here he's getting the same choice, but it's instead of a a gift, he would have to take it. And by taking it, he would have to consume and fracture a lot of pieces of the world. Yeah, that isn't something that Percy's going to do unless he has to. Mm -hmm. Which I'm just, I'm realizing now that all sudden I really had to do was like threaten to kill Annabeth and Percy would have done it. (laughs) Yep. I've just been waiting for this very explicit, like, save a friend, save the world moment. And Mm. they keep not giving it to me. (laughs) If he dug a little bit deeper and found, you know, that weakness. Maybe this is proving us right, and that when he dug for weaknesses inside Percy, he didn't pull out, you know, his supposed fatal flaw. He pulled out his actual fatal flaw. (laughs) The want for power. Mm Mm-hmm. But if he'd just dug a little bit deeper, maybe he would have realized that this, the secret was really just putting his friends in slightly more danger. Yeah. I mean, you see it with Nekbet. He did not want to do that, but... Yeah. And you see it with, like, that's the reason that he grabs Setnay in the first place, is because Carter is dying. Yeah. It also ends with, apparently, Nekbet having left the crown with them. Percy thinks to tempt them again. Yeah, he says that he knows that Nekbet went back to wherever goddesses go, um, but that traces of her personality linger in the corner of his mind, just enough to make him uncomfortably sure that the crown was left as a test. Mm. Wonder if that will wear off soon? <laughs> or was it ever there? Was it, Or maybe it's just that's how his brain is, yeah. and she just brought it out a little bit. 
That's true. I was thinking, like, you know, with Sadie and Carter, like, the gods are with them always. Mm. And it, it made me curious whether, like, if Nekbet came back, if she could just, like, possess him. Well, I guess he's now a magician of Nekbet, or whatever the title is. I think it's, like, patron or something. I don't remember. Percy Jackson, Greek, Roman, and Egyptian now. Yeah. <laughs> But what they choose to do with it is... Don't they They take it back to Brooklyn, right? Yeah, they take it to put in their vault and their storage. And, yeah. And they conclude to keep their world separate. The funny little throwaway line where Percy's like, bet Chiron already knows about the Egyptians, which considering his track record with the Romans is actually possible, and that annoys me so much. Yeah, he... he not, not a Rick at Chiron. I'm yeah. just like, oh my god. He definitely knows. Yeah. He knows all he knows. about the Magnus Tate series also. Yep. But uh, this story ends with them going their separate ways and Percy and Annabeth once again missing their movie date and going to get cheeseburgers. And it ends with Annabeth saying, I'm glad you're not a god and kissing Percy. And he says, I decided that I was glad too." in that moment. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. (laughs) Like he spends the whole story being like that I would never. Of course not. And then at the very end is like, okay, I've decided just now. Sorry. <laughs> yep. It took me a long time, but I got there. <laughs> As we said, I think there's a difference between like who you are in terms of your basis instincts and who you are in terms of what you choose to do with them. Yeah. And I, I do think Percy is glad to not be a god and to not be immortal. I think yeah. it's just there is logic to becoming immortal so that you can do the right thing and keep your family safe and all of that um and i do enjoy that the final sentence of the short story is a question Mm -hmm. you know it's a kiss in the sunset and the promise of a good bacon cheeseburger with that kind of payoff who needs immortality and i was like great question that i hope will uh be addressed in in chalice of the gods because when i was reading this i was really worried that we like we were gonna reach a solid like and like it's fairly solid that percy's like i don't want to be a god but it's left in a place where he could very easily continue to have that moment in chalice of the Mm. gods because when i was reading it i was worried that like we would leave it in a place that was so solid that we wouldn't get to have that question in Mm. chalice of the gods and that it would just be like none of us would ever drink from this maybe it'll be annabeth though Maybe. Maybe. He's sitting there like, I would never do this. While Annabeth's like, this might have been a good idea. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we get that thing where Carter says, like, I don't know, like, if it wasn't you, if I'd been tempted, if one of us, the other of us had been tempted, who knows what would have happened. Yeah. Okay, so if you were to give a bead to this short story, what would you give it? I'd do a vulture, I think. I would probably also do a vulture. But I can't do the (laughs) same thing. We've never done that before. I can't do that. (laughs) Maybe mine is also a vulture, but it's, like, little vulture in a sky, and there's, like, clearly a guy, and it's, you know, it's the scene, but Mm. it's small on a bead. Just to one-up you. (laughs) Thank you all for listening to Monster Donut. Next time... We will be reading Chalice of the Gods, which is wild. I'm so I know. I'm excited. I'm so excited. Book. I can finally read a new book. Yeah. I'm so curious. I'm so afraid of him. <laughs> I'm so afraid of this book. It's going to be great. I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. No, I think like, I mean, I'm going to talk about this in that episode. Well, because we're going to start out with predictions. But I really do think him being on the set of the TV show and having to return to like the lightning thief brain that he was Mm. in that he'll like get back into that early Percy Jackson vibe Mm. and that it will be good that's my theory and like sitting there in the writer's room and having analytical discussions about your creation like going and and writing a a new book in that universe just I have high hopes but also I'm keeping my expectations low (laughs) yeah so if you would like to see the art that I make for this episode you can find us on social media on Twitter Instagram and TikTok at pjopod and you can also send us any thoughts that you have uh to our email monsterdonutpodcast at gmail.com i haven't mentioned these episodes are on youtube i finally did it (laughs) what (laughs) i finally started posting them on youtube so you can find this on youtube it's not on my personal one like i've been saying it was going to be it will i'll probably eventually post 
there, but for now it's uh, just search Monster Donut and it's up there. I've been posting them fairly slowly and a little bit out of order, but I'm gonna <laughs> make a playlist of them eventually. What else? Enjoy Chalice of the Gods. I hope you love it. Mm -hmm. Fill out your bingo cards. I hope you win. <laughs> I don't know. I want to. I everyone send us your thoughts because I'm going to be posting so much about it. I'm going to be posting all kinds of spoilers. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, don't follow Phoebe. I, if, I'll put um, like in my in my uh, name like spoilers for Chalice of the Gods so that if people don't want it, it won't show up on your feed as long as you have that like blocked or blacklisted or whatever you call it on Twitter. Um, we have we currently have 99 readings on Spotify. Wait, we're at 99? We're at 99. I need I need someone to get on there. Just one of you. Someone get on there and make it 100 <laughs> right now. And like, I don't know, rate us on Apple and all the other ones. But more importantly, we're at 99. <laughs> and if you'd like to support us monetarily, we have a Kofi or coffee that you can find in our link tree. And also, I made merch. Uh, to celebrate getting to the end of Heroes of Olympus. You know, we've got hats, we've got shirts, we've got pillows, we've got shower curtains. <laughs> <We've> got... <laughs> Redbubble um, has yeah, everything so you could ever need. What happened was that Phoebe discovered that you can check everything on Redbubble and get some truly zany things. You can have it all on Redbubble, it turns out. So there, there are a lot of like different designs with like just the donut. I created some new like monster donut stuff, um, as well as like Death in the Deep Seas sponsored by Monster Donut. And we'll just keep adding to that. It's also got some of my art on there that you can buy as stickers and things like that. So yeah, if you want to get something back from monetarily supporting us. <laughs> <laughs> Besides our beautiful voices. Yeah, if you don't like us enough to just donate, you can also buy merch. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do end up buying, please tweet at us or something with images of you wearing it because oh I God, gotta yeah. know. <laughs> Especially if you buy, what is it, like a throw blanket? I gotta see that. <laughs> I gotta. I need to see you with the shower curtain in your bathroom. <laughs> I think there are bath mats too. Oh my god. A fully monster donut themed bathroom. <laughs> this is what the people want. It's what we've all been asking for. <laughs> okay. Bye everybody. Bye.